The original of today's interview was recorded in Spanish with Angelica Sanchez. This English reenactment was recorded with the voice actor Terry Richter. I came to know Angelica in the context of the Son Jarocho workshops at the Centro Cultural de México here in Santa Ana. In those workshops, as well as in community fandangos, I started out by admiring Angelica's natural facility with the poetry sung in this tradition. She has a fine personal repertory of verses for singing. With time, I also came to admire her commitment as a single mother to her sons. She mentions them in the interview. I also must admit that I have admired, not to say envied, her very personal, brilliant fashion sense, always topped by a splendid mane of curly hair. Good afternoon. It's the 24th of August, 2020, and I'm here with my interviewee, Angelica Sanchez, on the line. We're going to begin with a few basic questions in order to know something about who she is. So, Angelica, how old are you? Uh, I just turned 48. No. (laughs) (laughs) That's not possible. (laughs) Well, actually, thank you for that. No, um, (laughs) I look younger. I I look younger, but yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, incredible. Well, uh, I'm impressed. In what part of the world were you born, and and where did you grow up? In the district of Xochimilco. I grew up in a village near there. Well, where I was born and lived until I was seven. And from there I went to another community with my parents, also close to the urban area, closer to Mexico City, and lived there till I was 14. And after I turned 14, I had to immigrate here, here to California. Southern California. In what part of Southern California did you arrive? Orange County. To oh, Orange. Directly to Orange. Directly to Orange, yep. Yeah, I, I lived here till I was 21. And at 21, I returned to Mexico and lived there for another 15, 15 or so years. Huh. Interesting. And now I'm here again. I returned 10 years ago. That's interesting. You know, I'm learning so much about my fellow Santanerics and their life histories. It's a privilege for me. So then, what job or position do you hold now? I work cleaning houses. Ah, and and you work freelance then? Yeah. Yeah, I, I work freelance, and I like the work. I like it because I'm able to dedicate a lot of time to my sons. You've met them. Mm. You know my sons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know and <laughs> with this work, I have the chance to leave them at school. I can pick them up from school and, and do things together. Uh, that's great. So that to a certain point, you choose your own schedule. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the blessings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the life experiences that led you to do this work here in Orange County? Okay, well, well, I was with my partner, right, mm. with my family, but we separated because of circumstances, you know, mm-hmm. just <laughs> life stuff. And I realized, well, I've always worked, right, but I realized I had to work something closer to full time. Of, of course, I had to cover the whole economic picture, my economic situation with my family because my son stayed with me, right? Uh But at the same time, I had to think about my sons. I mean, I'm really attached to them. And and I I realized consciously that they needed a lot of my time, you know, in order to make up for their father's absence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seemed to me that by working three or four hours a day, I could earn the same thing that I would earn in a factory because, you know, I don't have any academic training, no career or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I could work less time, not neglect my sons and, and economically, well, I could earn almost the same or maybe even a little bit more. And that's how I decided. And I said, well, certainly something I know how to do. (laughs) I know how it's done because I do it all the time, every day. 
in my house. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. So how has it been for you recently in the last six months with the pandemic? It's affected your kind of work a lot, hasn't it? Oh, yes, definitely. The first two months I stopped working altogether. I wasn't working at all. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's been hard. R- really hard, but... Um, I, I think things are starting to normalize a little bit. Yeah, little by little, bit by bit. We're getting used to the new protocols with face masks and so on. It's a new system, new, I don't know, it, sometimes it frightens me, you know, because it's like there's a new, there are new rules that are coming to us little by little, right? Bit by bit. And, when we least realize that we're going to be inside this new system, this change that's so <sighs> yeah. yeah right now seems so strange to us. But someday, <laughs> I think we're going to see it all as normal. I I've always said that this thing of using face masks. Uh, someday we're going to use them like any other item of clothing, completely naturally. <laughs> 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 Yeah, really, like like wearing socks or underwear. That's how we'll use them. I say it would be ideal if we got used to that way of doing things. Because even when we've defeated this virus, there's going to be other viruses, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, public health is a real thing with so many people on this planet. We have to be more careful with each other. So I, I kind of feel like this is a warning from the universe. Yeah. Yeah, and also with so much pollution. We we should have been doing it before, right? (laughs) Right. With all the pollution we have here. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Many thanks for sharing these various versions of your songs. Angelica chose, for the song representing where she comes from, the Cancion Mixteca of José López Alaves. And for the one that represents her hopes for the future, Violeta Parra's Gracias a la Vida, as interpreted by Mercedes Sosa. I learned a lot. Okay, so, well, let's let's talk for a little bit about the Cancion Mixteca, because we do have several versions. Which one do you want to begin with? Well, I like both of them, but, uh, okay, let's begin with the first one. Okay, okay, sure. Lejos estoy de suelo donde he nacido Inmensa nostalgia invade mi pensamiento Oh my goodness, okay Well, so I, I wonder, when you listen to this song, is is there like a a specific occasion or a time in your life that inspires you to listen to this song? Uh, yeah, yeah, there is. So this song I remember from when I was little. I used to hear my grandmother sing it on my mom's side, my maternal grandmother. She often sang it when she got together with my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, who she was related to. Mm. So that they'd get together and sing have a drink or two, and sing. I remember it like that, just like that, with guitar. Ah, oh, they sing with guitar. Yeah, my grandfather sang and played the guitar, and my grandmother sang too. So when I heard it, like later in life, uh, a lot of memories came back to me, and I said, oh, I know this song. And I began to remember. M- my grandmother had... Very few memories of her childhood because it was during the revolution when they had to move around a lot. <sighs> yeah. So she, in effect, she came from the same period of time as the song. It's, it's a song from the revolution. <laughs> That's wonderful. And, and so where were you all when, when you, as a child, heard your grandparents playing and singing this song? In Mexico City. Yeah. But my grandparents came from Veracruz. Ah, and so uh, for you or for your family, the part that's specifically Mixteca, 
it's not that so much as as uh, well the the general nostalgia that it expresses is is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, nostalgia for the past, for what's been lost, mm-hmm. for the the lands that have been left behind. Right. Uh, I guess in a certain sense, if you immigrate, you identify with this kind of music. The history of the Cancion Mixteca parallels that of the Mexican Revolution. Its classically trained composer, José López Alaves, joined the forces of Pancho Villa during the conflict. It is told that in 1912 he found himself in Querétaro, far from his native Sierra Mixteca of Oaxaca, and that in a fit of homesickness he composed the melody while seated under a tree. Some years later, with lyrics duly added, the Cancion Mixteca won a national competition for First Mexican Song. Since that time, it has been a musical icon of Mexicanness and been recorded in a great many versions worth exploring in their own right for their sheer variety of interpretation. But in the century since the revolution, the song has become more like a general hymn of nostalgia for the, the many, many people who've migrated from Mexico. Yeah, yeah. And that nostalgia is pretty strong. It's true. Uh, just the, I guess, the simple fact of the music, right? I mean, one can perceive how much, how much nostalgia or how much sadness that man put into it. And so when do you listen to it nowadays? When I was... When we talked about this, my idea of choosing two songs, I said, oh, that's hard. That's really hard because there are so many. I love music and there's just so much interesting music. Uh, So everyone was saying to me, why didn't you choose X, Y, Z? People, well, my sons, they said, why didn't you choose that one, Mom? The one we know is El Butaquito. What's it called? Uh, ah, Cielito Lindo. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Cielito Lindo, yeah, it represents Mexico. Ay, 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 ay. Canta y no llores, porque cantando se alegran Cielito Lindo los corazones. Ay, 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 ay. And more than that, an, an interesting fact is that they say that the song's composer was Quirino Mendoza. Mendoza was a native of the town where I came to live when I was seven. Ah. But it isn't, it isn't exactly... I, I was researching it, and it isn't exactly by him. I think, I think he made a version of it in his own style, right? Yeah. Yeah, according to my understanding, that's right. Uh Uh-huh. But it's very... In school, they taught us that Querino Mendoza was the composer of that song. Really interesting. Really important, right? Like like another hymn of Mexico. Mm, Exactly. Mm Mm-hmm. But, well, I like this other one. Choosing was hard. Choosing was hard for me, right? Because I love music so much. You know what? It's hard for everyone I interview. Especially in this case, because my grandmother and I got to be great friends. Hmm. And with them, well, now I realize, you know, she, she was a very humble person. And she. What was, she, what was her name? She had a lot of memories. Um, her name was Celestina Honorato. So she used to talk a lot with me, and a, a few of her memories. Well, I mean, I feel kind of lucky, you know, because sometimes in the family I'll mention something and they'll ask me, how is it you know that? Things not even her children know. (laughs) Because she and I, because she and I, we talked a lot. We talked a lot. (laughs) One interesting thing, she, because of all the movement that there was, like during the revolution, right? She, did, she didn't know when she was born, exactly what day she was born on. She didn't know exactly where she was born. As far as she can remember, it was Veracruz, the mountains of Veracruz. But 
one of my brothers and I came to the conclusion that the mountains of Veracruz was where they ended up hiding when they were fleeing the conflicts. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't know exactly. She didn't remember. Not at all. She only knew. <laughs> she, she'd say, I'm from 1915. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I don't remember if it was 1915 or 1910. That's what my grandmother would say to me. <laughs> Well, I, I imagine it was like that for a lot of people from that generation, right? Like like you say, there was a lot of movement. Mexico in that period was chaos, a total chaos. And something I find striking is that a song as sweet as this one came out of that chaos. I I feel like it has something something to do with well the, the, the sweetness of the Mexican soul. <laughs> I, I don't know. But, but it's sad, too, right? D- does it make you cry, this song, sometimes? Always. Every time I really listen to it, it does. It moves feelings, memories. And like I said, just the simple sound of the music. Never mind the words. <laughs> the music is something you can feel. Mm. And so, speaking of different versions... Well, the the version we just listened to is, uh, I like it a lot because the singing is beautiful, but not so, not dramatic. It's it's more like, I don't know, with an open heart, it seems to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I chose it because well, that's what I'm telling you. It's the closest to what I remember from my grandparents, right? Like I said, just them, just them and a guitar. But there are a lot of versions. There's one version with a soprano. I, I don't remember who she is. Also with many other artists, like Miguel Aceves Mejia and Pedro Vargas. That's another nice version, too. Hmm. I found a version, and I wonder what you think of this version. It's one by Lola Beltran. Do you know it? Ah, Yes. Mm-hmm. It's quite different. So let's listen to a minute of Lola Beltran because I'd like to know what you think of her way. It's the same song, but really it isn't. It's not the same song at all. Mm-mm-mm. It expresses a different feeling. I think so. And I'd like to know your thoughts about this. So here goes. <laughs> al viento quisiera llorar quisiera morir de sentimiento oh tierra del sol That's a really really good version too <laughs> It's it's wonderful but, well, can you tell me something about the feelings this version brings up for you? Mm-hmm. Different from the other. Like more, well, hmm. the first version is more personal to me, to my homeland, you know, mm. the memory it brings. The second version, there's like m- more pain, I think. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Or something. <sighs> to me, it seems like, yeah, the, the the pain is more obvious, right? But at the same time, it seems to me like it's a, a little less. I, I don't want to say less sincere, but it's that this is a really professional singer, and there's this element of dramatizing herself. Mm-hmm, exactly, and it's a bit like, well. It's over the top. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And so, it, so it makes me laugh. <laughs> it's like a little more, what would it be? Like more acted, uh-huh, more uh-huh. actually less, less intense could be. Yeah. It's, it's like the pain that it causes is less personal, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm, more synthetic. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah, like like an artifact instead of a sung feeling. 
Yeah, how much difference there is, right, in little details. So much difference, you know? Yeah, makes all the difference, all the difference. Because a song is in its performance. It's, it, well, the song is in the singer. And there are a thousand ways to sing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I say to my son sometimes, the difference isn't in what you say, it's in how you say it, you know? Yep, you're absolutely right. <laughs> what a good lesson for your sons. Yeah. <laughs> well, what a beautiful memory you've shared with me here. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And now let's go to your second song, if you don't mind, and, and, unless you have more to say. No, no, that's fine. So I, I noticed with this one, with, with your choice of a song that represents your hopes, I, I noticed a thread that connects the two choices. And, th- and that was, well, nostalgia. I think that both mm. songs, your first song and your second one, although they're quite different, they both have this nostalgia that is r- really noticeable. So let's listen to Mercedes, good old Mercedes, singing Gracias a la Vida. And it, if you don't mind, I'm going to play a concert version because you can hear the audience and their enthusiasm, and I think it's a really great part of it. Sure. Great. Gracias a la vida. Me ha dado tanto, me dio dos luceros, que cuando los abro. That song gives me chills. I love that. <sighs> me too. And it makes me cry every time I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's so, my heart. Oh, God. It's yeah, no, I mean. Earnest. Oh, <laughs> it's intense too, oh, isn't it? Just me. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of tears. Yeah. So, um, tell me, tell me a little bit about how this song came into your life. Okay, I remember it from. Uh, so I was born in 1972, right? And I remember this song from when I was really little, among the songs I used to listen to. My father had a record player. He listened to other kinds of music, like trios. He he was a fan of Javier Solis. But this record in particular belonged to my older brother. Uh And I listened to this song a lot, and I I learned it by heart. I was good at learning that kind of thing. Years later, I listened to it a lot when I was pregnant with my third son. And so I was listening to it. I remember I remember because my son's father said to me, stop listening to that music. <laughs> I found it on a disc of Trova music. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. It had various singer-songwriters, you know, and among them was this song. Among all those other songs came this one, and it caught my attention because it reminded me of when I was little. I actually remembered it. <laughs> Nothing to do with my being that age, right? I mean, I should have been listening to children's music when I was seven years old. But but it brought me back to that time, and I asked myself, How? So it turns out that my older brother at that time, we remember it now, it's, they were, I don't know, difficult, difficult times when Tlatelolco happened in Mexico City. (sighs) Exactly. Of course. And, and so... Angelica mentions in passing when Tlatelolco happened, and she refers to it as difficult. She's talking about the horrific culmination of a period of repression of student protest and of union organizing, begun in the late 1960s by the government of the then president of Mexico, Gustavo Díaz Ordaz. On the day and night of the 2nd of October, 1968, the Mexican army and various special forces units of the municipal police opened fire on a student rally that was taking place in the Plaza de Tres Culturas, near the apartment blocks of Nonalco Tlatelolco in Mexico City. 
The figures took decades to be released and certified, but it is now believed that between three and four hundred people died, with hundreds more injured and over a thousand arrested. It also took a long time to reveal that the repressions organized by Diaz Ordaz's government received substantial support from the CIA here in the United States. It does not appear that Angelica's brother was directly involved, but events of this type would certainly have thrown a long shadow over the consciousness of any Mexican youth of that period. And your older brother, how old would he have been at this time? He was in high school, finishing high school. He was in the preparatoria, I think. Yeah. Yeah, in the preparatoria. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I imagine he would have felt very upset. Yeah, he was he was like 19 when all of this happened. Mm. So that's how I remembered that song. And at the time I didn't give it much importance, in fact. I mean, I listened to it, but then I didn't listen to Trova again for some time because my husband said to me, stop listening to that music, that's protest music. He, he didn't like it. He didn't like it. He didn't like it. And I said to him, okay, I won't listen to it. So it's not to have problems, you know. But I, but I had this memory. And later, after a while, I went back to listening to it, and I understood it better. And now, well, I love this song because it represents so much for me, you know. Like, you can live so many years reproaching yourself, blaming yourself, and, and feeling unhappy. And then comes the moment, a moment in life, where you begin to be grateful for everything, every day. You have a million things to be grateful for. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? I think it's one of the, I don't know, one of the signs of maturity, right? It's like there comes this moment in which one realizes that, well, it's time to give thanks because this is what we have and nothing more. (laughs) Yeah. You get to a certain level of consciousness, I guess, in which you give thanks for the tiniest details. You know, you give thanks for hot weather or cold weather. Everything. You begin giving thanks for everything. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because the most important of all is life, right? Everything is here. Because if you're not alive, there's nothing, or at least nothing for you. <laughs> nothing for you. <laughs> exactly. Yep. I imagine that everything will go on existing without me, but if I'm not here to enjoy or suffer from what there is, it's it's <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> like it's not here for me. Yeah, exactly. No, that that song is really profound, or really, really, it's the poetry. The, the, the poetry is, it's very interesting what you said. I, I mean, what your ex-husband said about, I mean, I understand the association with protest music, but I wouldn't automatically think of this song as a protest. H- how does this song in particular fit into that category? No, for me, it doesn't. It doesn't. But Mercedes Sosa is known for her other themes, right? For other themes she sings about? Ah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. He was making that connection, I imagine. And, well, hmm, was a person who was a bit, like, a bit sexist. (laughs) (laughs) A bit sexist, yes. And so there couldn't be protest, you know. (laughs) <laughs> so I've I've got the song lyrics in front of me on my screen. And near the end of the song, at that very same moment where the audience in, in this recording comes in, like shouting and clapping, all of that, that's where she sings, Y el canto de ustedes, que es mi mismo canto, el canto de todos, que es mi propio canto, which is to say, and your song, which is my same song. And the song of everyone, which is my own song. And in that moment, you hear the audience, you know, getting really excited, right?
So uh, those lines do have something. It's, it's, it's not protest exactly. I, I don't know. Mm. Like unity? Hmm. Similarity? Equality? Mm. That's it. Yeah, yep. yeah mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and, and I can imagine Mercedes Sosa on stage at that moment, like opening her arms up to the whole audience yeah. and, and yeah. One, of, one of those gestures she mm-hmm. used. So what do you think of her voice? Because, well, this song also exists in various versions, but it's true that Mercedes Sosa's version is probably the most famous. And for me, just like for you, it's our favorite version. And so what is it? That, that voice is unique, right? Mm-hmm. What, what do you think? Can, can you tell me a little bit about how it affects you, or your, your your thoughts about Mercedes' voice? Mercedes' voice. It makes me... Mm, the way I see it, you know what it makes me think? Her personage being kind of revolutionary. And it's like something... It's like something that we find in Son. You can protest peacefully through music. Mm. That's what it seems mm-hmm. like to me. The, the way she expresses, or with the feeling of expressing gently. Gently, just like the song says, right? Gently. Mm-hmm. I hear something in that voice. It's so difficult to describe, like, the quality of a voice. It's something that's impossible to describe, but... Her voice has something like, I I have this image before me of a sword in its sheath. Yeah, a sword in its sheath, like like something made of steel, a strong thing that can cut. But mostly she doesn't use it. It's just there in her voice, like like this element of steel, something really hard and really powerful. And, and you feel the presence of that power, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then she sings, and she sings softly. But there's like this hidden force. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Because, okay, so there are voices for me, right? Voices that sing, but they don't express this feeling. And this, like, expressing sweetness, but also with strength. That strength and that wholeness, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a unique voice. There's no other mm. like it. Yep. Well, just one more commentary on my part to wrap up our chat. It's that it, it it's something that set me thinking a little with this song in particular. It's it's that Okay, it's a song of thanks. But it's sad. It has a really obvious sadness, right? Like we <laughs> cried. <laughs> and those two feelings, thankfulness and sadness, what do they have to do with one another? Hmm. That's true. <laughs> giving thanks sadly isn't a thing, right? You're very happy giving thanks. I hadn't thought about that. Mm-hmm. And it's not like I have an answer to this question. It's it's just a thing that this song has. Yeah, like like a lot of nostalgia in the gratitude. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about it. And so, Angelica, how does this feeling, this mixed feeling that's so unique to this song, gratitude with sadness, what does it have to do with your hopes? Hmm. My hopes? Like the musical image of your hopes, because that's why you chose this song, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh... If as human beings, we were to find this, this gratitude, uh, we were to connect with ourselves, then we'd begin to realize, to give thanks that within everything, especially right now, right? With the situation we're all living in worldwide, so many of us are complaining. But apart from that, if we were to begin to give thanks for the fact that we're still here and that we're... Mm. we'd begin to appreciate, to appreciate, to appreciate ourselves, appreciate our families, to appreciate our children, 
our time. We live in civilization, right? Where everything is in motion. Everything's in a hurry. And while we're in this system, we forget our real selves, like the real essence of being human. And we begin to look for other things more, how do I say it, more superficial things? Hmm. Sometimes false things. False things. False things, exactly. And we're in a period, right, when we can live a lie in being and in having. You know what I mean? So it's like we're forgetting our own selves. What we really are is human beings. We begin to classify ourselves. And that's where racism comes from. That's where a whole lot of social problems come from, too. But if you connect to yourself, right? If you find yourself, you can you can find peace and begin to appreciate things. That's how you begin to appreciate, you know, and give thanks. Because I'm just like in the song, right? Medio dos luceros. Life gave me two eyes. It talks about many things that we don't often realize. We forget. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Between you and that song, I'm practically speechless. <laughs> it's interesting. For me, it's one way. I identify with this way, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it makes a lot of good sense. There's a lot of eloquence in what you're saying. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Gracias a la vida. <laughs> Thanks to life. Thanks to you. Really. I'm so grateful for this interview. I, I love the way you think and talk about music. It's really clear that you, you think a lot before you speak. And that's just so rare in life. Most of us just talk blah, 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 without really hooking up our brains, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you think that? Oh, dear. Well, you've put me into a really thoughtful place, and I appreciate that a lot. Thank you, Elizabeth. I do, too. It's so great that there's a, a space to express this because, you know, I, I was thinking here in my community, right? People always tell me, oh, you get a lot of exercise. Oh, we always see you so active and you go to your music classes. And well, not right now. We're suffering without son. <laughs> but they do say to me, hey, why don't you invite us to do exercises with you or share cooking recipes? I mean, sometimes there's just so much to share. You have, well, not me, right, but everyone. I'll know one thing. Someone else knows another thing. But we can share them. But with each person in their space, hanging on to what they know without sharing it, we end up suffocating, you know? Yeah. That's maybe the most difficult thing about this period of pandemic, right? It's like... Mm -hmm. Well, a platform like this, Zoom, it, it works okay, but it's not the same, mm. not at all. And in the case of a group music like Son, well, it's it's become impossible. Uh, we have to take out what we're keeping inside. You know, because it's like, if you hang on, hang on, hang on to things. Let's take an example. You keep a bunch of things in a box, a whole big, 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 big bunch of things. There's going to come a moment where that box doesn't close. That's for sure because of everything you have in there. But if you take it out and you share it, there's space for more. For knowledge, right? Like what you have inside. Because you have a lot of knowledge about what music is academically, right? Well, for what it's worth, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then it's a good thing because I feel that in, in our system... The only sharing, or the only thing that makes us share, is selling, buying, selling, buying. Like that. And that's what has disconnected us. Because we have things that can't be bought and sold, right? That we can share among ourselves. And that is our knowledge. That's true. But the greatest knowledge, I tell you, is knowing how to listen. How to have dialogues with people. The art is being able to converse, being able to dialogue with people about what music is. That's what I think. Yes, that's true. That's true. Well, what a lovely conversation. 
It was you who did the work of choosing the songs and thinking so beautifully about them. Have a lovely afternoon with your sons, and, and we'll be in contact. Of course. Take good care, be well, and have a nice afternoon. Yes. You too. Bye. Thanks. Angelica chose well-known songs and caused me to realize that I did not know them as well as I thought. There's a notable current of nostalgia that flows through her musical choices. Angelica herself does not present as a melancholy person, and I doubt she'd describe herself as one, but her songs brought forward a melancholy strain. The Mexican anthropologist and sociologist Roger Bartra has theorized Mexican melancholy as a peculiar and positive national strength, suggesting that it is, quote, a magnificent instrument for reflection because of how melancholy combines reason and emotion. I think in this regard it's important to make a distinction between melancholy and depression. I would perhaps add to Bartra's insight that Mexican music explores and sounds above all the emotional side of this magnificent instrument of melancholy. Would you like to know more? On our website at siofuera.org, you can find lyrics to the songs we discuss, original essays about the issues of history, culture, and politics that come up in every interview, as well as links to related information. You'll also find an amazing playlist of all the songs from all the interviews to date. We invite your comments or questions. Contact us at our website or participate in the Si Yo Fuera conversation on social media. We're out there on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And then there's just plain old word of mouth. If you like our show, do please tell your friends and your family to give it a listen. And do please subscribe on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll bring a new interview for you every two weeks on Friday mornings. Our wonderful production team is Julia Alanis, Zoe Broussard, David Castañeda, Cynthia Marcel de la Torre, Laura Diaz, Pedro Frey, Deaneira Garcia, and Wesley McClintock. And special thanks to Alex Dolvin, without whom we could never have launched this boat. For now, and until the next interview, keep listening to one another. I'm Elizabeth Le Guin, and this is Si Yo Fuera Una Canción, If I Were a Song. Sonarían por las calles, las montañas y los valles, mi orgullo y mi pasión. ¿Quién soy yo de corazón? Soy una ola, soy una onda, una vibración que ronda por el Nuestra unidad más honda.